This is Impeccable's podcast interview series, where we interview leaders in the digital space. Hi, I'm Peck, CEO, founder of Impeccable. And in today's episode, we will be talking to Pakrash Chandran, an amazing designer, ex-Googler designer, entrepreneur, founder, and uh, we want to learn more about things like design at Google, his journey, his life in general, and how he came to be here. So Prakash, welcome to the show. It's so great to be here. And, uh, you know, you, you and I have known each other for probably, what, seven, eight years now? And uh, for a long time, been, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's been an amazing journey. Uh, so we, we met at a co-working space, if I recall. And, uh, you know, I was very, I, I learned that you were uh, a designer at Picasa. And for those of you who don't remember or know about Picasa, it was an amazing uh, desktop photo sharing uh, application that was extremely well designed and extremely performant. But I'd love to kind of unpack that and, and your journey. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about the journey. Um, you know, I, I basically spent a lot of my, uh, I guess, childhood into college um, dabbling in computing, like a lot of people our age uh, do. And I won't say what our age is, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was a time when we used to play things like Doom and Quake, uh, and the internet was really just coming about. And at the time, um, when I was in high school, I remember I uh, started a little web design company with my friend. And when I say company, it was just him and I, um, because we wanted to actually start publishing our strategies for Doom, uh, which is oh, wow. an online game online. And then so we learned like how to build websites on GeoCities. And then we started developing it for other people because my mom started telling people like, hey, my son knows how to how to make websites. <laughs> I uh, love your mom voice. <laughs> yeah, my son knows how to make websites. And so you should pay him to do that for you. Um, they're going to be a thing one day, you know. That's what she, she always used to say. Um, oh, she was right. And she was right. And she was right. And so throughout, um, throughout college, I was doing web design. So I had a lot of experience in Photoshop. And one of the things, one of the unique things that I did uh, in, in college over the summer is I, I used to work at this software. It was like a software booth at a swap meet. And next door to that software booth was this guy named Ron Lopez. And what he used to do was image editing. So it, like, for example, let's say you, uh, you know, now we have apps to do all of this, but let's say you were closing your eyes in a picture and you wanted to open them up. You would have to go to some professional that knew Photoshop really well to do this. I was always fascinated by this. So I, you know, I went to sit down with him and over the summer when I wasn't working in this booth, I would sit down and he would teach me like feathering techniques and the stamp tool and all of these cool things in Photoshop, which then gave me like the uh, prowess to be able to actually work my way in Photoshop very well. So after, after uh, I graduated college, I had all this practical like design experience and um, I had a lot of client work under my belt. And so it basically got to the point where I was able to parlay that into a profession, even though I didn't realize what I was doing at the time, I was able to like parlay that. And uh, I took an, an internship in, in Santa Barbara, actually working at wow. this company called uh, Go To My PC. And uh, there was someone that worked there was, that was related to the Picasa team. And I was able to um, interview and get my way into Picasa that way. So yeah. Picasa, photo organizing software within a year, they were acquired by Google. I was called by everyone, the lucky bastard. I don't know if this, <laughs> this will make it in, um, but I was the last hire and they are 100% right. I was brought Oh, in. wow. You're the last one out. The the last, last one in. Last one in, doors closed. I didn't know this was happening at the time. When I joined, apparently, there were offers on the table from Apple, from Google, from Yahoo um, to acquire Picasa. And oh, wow. they, they had chosen um, Google after you know months yeah. of operation. So, so you could have been an Apple designer for, for a decade. Yeah. <laughs> if, the thought, though, was that if Apple purchased Picasa, they would actually have just sunsetted the product. I, I think I the, the, the thought, and at least when I, when I talked to the, the CEO, Michael Herf, at the time, um, he, was, he talked about what his vision for the product would be. And he truly 
um, because there were multiple offers on the table, he wanted to join the company that would really not only see the vision, but help him grow and scale it. And Google yeah. was the right pick because the second version of Picasa was uh, distributed and made free on the internet versus the on the shelf software that it was before. At, at what point do you think like technology and design was something like you, even before that, getting into that? Was that all from the Doom game, video game stuff or? Yeah, I think it very much started with my love for video games and everything that I did around the computer, whether it be, you know, building a faster computer to editing the modem strings to make my connection better. You know, everything was really around how can I, uh, how can I game more? And I, I genuinely feel like that uh, drive and that passion um, really fueled all of the technological understanding that I have today. And yeah, just the yearn, yearning to like publish my strategies out into the world, you know, morphed into this, this business. And it, it kind of went, it just went from there. I, I almost, I just fell into it. You know, yeah. it wasn't something that was planned out at all. And in fact, at the time, my parents thought that I was wasting my time. My dad would say <laughs> to me, son, when is this going to end? Why are you wasting your time on this <laughs> damn computer? Like he would always say this because, you know, and I really can't blame them because at the time their model of success was either to be a doctor or, or a lawyer, right? right? Or an engineer and an engineer being like the hard sciences. Right. Um, not, not what we know as an engineer today. So they looked at me and it didn't fit the model of success, you know? Yeah. And so it was, I think, uh, for us, especially as immigrants, it's like we had, we have to figure out, or sorry, children of immigrant parents, we have to figure out how our own path and how we thrive. And especially going up and, and modeling this new world of the internet was very foreign, you know? And I think that that was interesting coming up. And it wasn't until... I joined Google, but not only joining Google until they like, I think they were uh, published in Time or like in, in Forbes or something like that, where my parents were like, oh, wow, this is actually this is very good. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, I'd love to kind of dig into kind of your time at Google. I'd love to kind of get your insight on what makes it special, what makes design at Google special. You know, I think one of the things that I, re I appreciate more now than I did back then is that Google had a couple tenants um, that they ingrained as part of their co company culture from the get-go. We all know the one, you know, don't be evil. Um, but they also had one that said, uh, follow or focus on the user and all else will follow. And that was a core tenant that really was um, baked into not only the UX team, but the way that we thought about products at the time. And so because of the leadership making a statement, <clears throat> it allowed that cultural culture of uh, user-centered design to flourish at Google. And I think it was something that I really didn't understand or appreciate as a young designer, but I learned um, from the other designers that were there. I truly, I truly believe, you know, design, it's like one part is the competence, like, are, like can you put how do you put the pixels on the page? Are you able right. to do it in an efficient manner? Uh, manner? Um, but then I guess there's the culture of design. And part of that is like being able to share your work, being able to talk about your work, being able to be an advocate um, and champion um, your work throughout the organization and then solicit feedback in a way that's going to be productive and doesn't damage your ego, but is going to be collaborative. Um, so I think there's so many facets to being a good designer and you know better than anyone that that needs to be trained and instilled very early on in someone's design career. Yeah, and, and not just uh, damaging your ego, but but the the client's ego, for example, right? Like they they since they're not designers, they're they may not be able to express what they want or, or looking for in a good way, and it's very it can be very easy to put down the client say because they don't know what they don't know. Uh, so you have to kind of learn these soft skills on. Kind of diplomacy, right? <laughs> yeah, and, you know, being being very diplomatic and being being very empathetic on how you. Yeah, me, me and a couple of the impeccables, we talk about it as verbal jujitsu. Uh, <laughs> I like it. Verbal jujitsu, yeah, because you know sometimes you um, you won't always win. Even like for example, when you're doing client work, you know sometimes uh, the client may have just a different paradigm or a different way of thinking. And even 
given all of the experience you have as a, a designer or a design leader, um, you might sometimes have to just concede and understand that that's, that is their view of the world. And that's actually something else that I learned uh, while I was at Google. Um, you know, I remember when Twitter was like becoming something when we were all designers at Google. I, along with many other well-known designers who I won't name, thought that it was the stupidest thing in the world. It was like, what a, what a dumb idea. Like, who is going to, who's going to use a platform like this? Um, but it just goes to show you, I mean, look at where Twitter is today. I mean, like, arguably slightly undervalued, but everyone is on Twitter, right? Yeah. And it has changed the way we think about, like, this text-based medium and they've just introduced this new term of the tweet that we never thought would be a thing. I remember when the tweet came out, it, it felt like a joke in the beginning. So I think one of the things that I have learned, not only from that example, but in doing work with clients at Impeccable, is that you, you might think you know, um, given your experience, but you may not. You know, people, they sometimes their perspectives, the perspectives matter. And you have yeah. to be able to understand that you are weaving into their narrative um, as a designer, and it's your job not to tell them what to do, but to, again, be collaborative and make sure that they're able to express their vision um, in the right way. Now, I'd love to kind of move on to the next chapter. At some point, you decided to, to leave Google and, and start a business. And yep. that brings me to your next chapter, I think, in your life, in your career from, from a designer to, to an entrepreneur. You know, you made it. Why Why leave? From a very early age, and I can't really put my finger on why this is, I've always wanted to try something on my own. You know, at Google, I was getting paid a very good salary. Like, I was very successful for my age, basically. And I think the way I always looked at it is like, I didn't really do that. Like, I didn't personally do that. That was just like good timing. Um, and so I've always, I always wanted to like prove it to myself. Like, is this something that I can go off and and do on my own. And I've just wanted to be, you know, the captain of my own ship. And I started uh, my startup and my startup was called Zabinit. And the original purpose for, uh, for Zabinit was really to be an online filing cabinet for people. You know, we make so many, <laughs> we, yeah, hence Zabinit. We make so many purchases. We have a, a massive relationship with the products that we buy, but we don't have one place to organize it like we did at the time with Facebook. So I'm like, I want to be that for the products and services that we have relationships with. I want to be that one place. I learned a very um, big lesson or many very big lessons around moving from a company like Google to starting something on my own where I just, I had just assumed that I would have immediate success because of my pedigree. Um, so I spent the next couple of years trying to sell this vision that I just articulated um, of Zabinit and, and learning that people really didn't care about this problem that I was trying to solve. Again, I was looking, I had a solution trying to find a problem and um, which I'm sure you see all the time. Um, but yeah, you know, I, over the, the course of uh, those number of years and, and just trying and trying to, and trying, I learned so much just about what it takes to build a product from the ground up, going door to door, to sell because I chose one of the hardest markets you can sell into, which is SMB. Um, I also learned about how to pitch investors. Uh, I learned how to fail a lot. I basically say I, I spent three and a half years getting the crap kicked out of me. Oh. Um, but what a learning experience it was. And I would not be the person that I am today were it not for Zabinit. Yeah. yeah, I would say you're a much stronger designer for it, right? Uh, had you uh, stayed in at Google, right? you would have thought, oh, you know, I designed something and immediate and maybe falsely attributed, uh, you know, the millions of users to, to the design, uh, yeah. you know, where, where it, it might've been writing on the coattails of Google or Google's marketing or, you know, what, what have you. Right. So I think, uh, being outside of kind of Google's umbrella and Google's kind of protection and influence kind of help kind of make you a better designer. Yeah. And I think this gets down to like a fundamental question, like what is a good designer? You know, I think again, earlier when you're a young designer, you're working on like the, being a good tactician, like someone that can design well in a design product. And you just, maybe you'll start with a widget, then you move to a workflow, then you, you know, you just basically keep expanding your lens. But 
in the field of user experience, my view of it is once you become a good designer, you need to always, you will inevitably evolve into a product person. And what I mean by that is it's not just about the design. It's like, what does the entire experience look like? And how are you able to measure your success as a designer in that experience? So, you know, it's not just design tools. It's also product engagement metrics. And it's also being able to, to really, um, you know, codify the principles of your design and how it actually affects conversion and retention. And so um, I didn't come to realize that really until pretty much quite recently. But that's like my 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 best piece of advice to young designers is just to ready themselves for that evolution. Because if they just stick with design tools, which are getting better and better, um, you know, you're going to fit, you're going to blend in with every other designer that's out there. There's a lot of amazing, great designers. Um, but the more you can evolve into the horizontal customer experience person that understands product and product engagement and the way your design influences that, um, you know, the better you're going to be. Well, thank you so much, Prakash. Um, we really appreciate it. I love hearing your story. And I've always wanted to share your story with the rest of the world. And we're very honored that you're uh, working with us. You know, I've known you much longer than, uh, you know, we've been working together. And it's finally an honor that you're, you're working with Impeccable. I'd also like to take a moment to uh, uh, promote your podcast that you have, which is a podcast called Chapter One. You want to tell us a little bit about that? And we'll link it in the show notes as well. Yeah, I'm slightly embarrassed because I haven't updated it since my uh, my baby daughter was born, but I do plan on continuing. But yeah, the idea around chapter one is really to talk to entrepreneurs that have created something and the challenges and struggles they uh, face around getting out of first gear, that first chapter. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of podcasts out there that talk about the whole journey and uh, then it's a happy ending. But that first bit of time, that getting out of first gear is oftentimes, the, that's the most formidable time. And I really try to unpack everything that that entrepreneur goes through in order to get out of that, uh, that first gear. So yeah, that's chapter one. You can go to listen to chapter one.com to learn more about it. Um, again, there's a couple episodes there, but uh, there'll be more in the future. So I really appreciate it. Also worth noting that I am, um, I'm honored to be a uh, part of the Impeccable team. I have watched Peck grow um, the design agency from just himself um, to, is it 50 people now? I think so. Around-ish, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's truly incredible. And this culture um, that you've instilled in, you know, this continuous improvement, this growth and everyone helping each other and training each other and uh, everyone getting better together uh, has been uh, amazing to be a part of. And so uh, I'm honored and I know we, uh, the brand just stands for kick-ass work and I hope that we continue to do that moving forward. Thank you so much. Uh, it's very flattering and it's, uh, it's one of those things that being Asian, it's really hard to take compliments. So, but yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, and on that note, we'll stay tuned for the next uh, episode. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on the Impeccable Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to click the subscribe button on your favorite podcasting app so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.